Hello, everybody. This is Ray Dogum here. This is the Hyperledger Healthcare Special Interest Group meeting for February 1st. And I am just displaying here the antitrust policy notice. A little bit of housekeeping before we get started. Um, the Linux Foundation meeting involved participation by industry competitors, and it is the intention of the Linux Foundation to conduct all its activities in accordance with applicable antitrust and competition laws. Um, basically, it's important for everyone to make sure they don't say anything that is prohibited by law under the antitrust policies. And yeah, so this more details can be found in this link, linuxfoundation.org slash antitrust policy. Um, yeah, so again, welcome everyone. This is a hyperledger community. So everyone here is welcome. It is an open community. You can view the full Hyperledger code of conduct uh, by searching it as well. And just for everyone's awareness, Hyperledger sponsors, members are all here listed. You have premier members and general members listed. So your company might be listed and you might not even know it. So um, hopefully we'll continue to gain more members into our community here. And if you haven't been involved in an open source project before, it could be intimidating to start. Some tips to get comfortable. Feel free to lurk, you know, check out what others are doing on the wiki pages and communication channels as well. Uh, don't wait for an invitation to use the tools available, ask questions, introduce yourselves and share ideas. And please do read the code of conduct because we do we do try to set a high standard for professionalism um, in these meetings and conversations. That being said, I would like to jump over to our agenda for the day. And we have here, uh, let's see, four participants, Asha, Erica, and um, also I believe Doug is on as well. So thank you guys for joining very much. And uh, before we get started, would anyone like to introduce yourselves, maybe if you haven't already? Otherwise, we can get started. Okay. Anyone have any community announcements they'd like to share with the group? All right. So I just noticed I didn't turn on my video as well. Let me go ahead and do that. So terms of upcoming events related to healthcare and blockchain, there's a European blockchain convention happening February 15th through the 17th in Spain, in Barcelona. In March 20 to 24th, Paris Blockchain Week is happening. March 26th to the 29th, we have Vive 2023 in Nashville. April 17th through the 21st is HIMSS, which is one of the largest healthcare information technology um, events, like over 20 or 30,000 people typically. Uh, April 26th to the 28th is Consensus 2023 in Austin. Always an interesting event there. In May 18th to the 20th, Bitcoin 2023 in Miami is happening. And then in September 2023, Conv2x Global Blockchain Healthcare is happening in New Orleans. Um, if you have any other events going on, please feel free to add comment here in the agenda or on the YouTube page for others to be aware of. Yeah, I just wanted to add that February 24th to early March is East Denver in Denver. Yes, um, East Denver. How can I miss that? Um, not necessarily healthcare related, but last time I was there, there was some people um, doing some healthcare stuff and there was over 15,000 people last year. What were the dates again? I can look it up if you know. February twenty fourth, I think, to March sixth. I'll double check that. Right. I think the core event is like the beginning of March. Yeah. Right. Um. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah. Let me get the link as well for others. Are you going this year, Erica? I am, yeah. Nice. Awesome. All right. 
So moving on to some industry news articles. Uh, there's a lot here, so we might be moving pretty fast. If you have any comments, feel free to jump in. I think there's going to be some interesting potential discussion here. So I'm excited for you guys to you know participate. So this is in no particular order. The first one here is more medical schools withdraw from U.S. news listings. So not really blockchain related, but I thought it had some importance related to a reputation of a school or the reputation of a you know university here. And it's interesting how the reason a lot of these schools are dropping out of participating in this U.S. news listing is because it's leading to um, misaligned incentives internally with their with their internal university. So this is creating sort of um, an issue. And they think that by removing themselves from here, those incentives will be removed. And philosophically, it would be better for the universities not to be part of this. Any thoughts, anybody on this one? Yeah, it's, it's interesting because this these schools are, you know, some major medical school. So I think others will continue to drop, you know, you have. Um, so why exactly are they dropping? So you know how some ranking systems, you know, require you to have a certain number of um, spe specific type of students, for example, or specific kind of, um, I guess, let me read it here specifically. Yeah. So, for example, Columbia University says rankings perpetuate a narrow and elitist perspective on medical education. Right. Here, we reached the decision to end our participation, not because of concerns that these rankings are sometimes based on data that can be inaccurate or misleading, but because the rankings measure the wrong things. Mm -hmm. so, uh, the rankings provide a flawed and misleading assessment of medical schools, lack in accuracy, validity, and relevance. So that's sort of like the theme here. Um, yeah. I'm going to move, move on to the next one. And the reason I bring it up, just to kind of close the circle here, I think potentially if we have more transparent data from universities in a way, maybe even on a blockchain perhaps, or some distributed ledger um maybe we don't need like u.s news to make the rankings but it could be something that the universities can provide on a public shared ledger in some way that was my thought there um i don't think anyone's really working on that but just wanted to point it out what's holding DAOs back i thought this was interesting because there are a lot of proponents for DAOs and you know, I think there's a lot of potential for DAOs, but some things that were said here were interesting. Um, here, you know, they're talking about how in Wyoming, there's new DAO laws in Wyoming, Vermont, and Tennessee. Um, however, it became evident as soon as DAOs collided with the real world that these powerful new vehicles for crowdfunding and organization are constrained by immense coordination and regulatory costs that can negate the benefits of using a DAO in the first place. Um, so on the coordination side, DAOs add friction by add friction to using resources by requiring members to pass proposals. Um, by default, most DAOs today are at risk of being what Ethereum co-founder calls veto-rocracy, bureaucracy. So basically where the default outcome is no, unless a proposal sponsor rounds up sufficient support for the project so it sort of becomes like a popularity contest in a way in many ways um just making coordination actual decision making more difficult i think there's work being done on the coordination side of DAOs. there's some companies looking at how to make DAOs more effective uh, so it should be interesting here there's a note making DAOs work it's an important project for humanity because they promise us a more democratic future where we own and govern the town squares of tomorrow. So we'll see. Um, I think this is a interesting thought here. So I appreciated it. Wanted to share it with you all. 
Yeah, my experience with it has been it's been hard to incentivize people to really participate when it's all a lot of the ones I've been in have been really a volunteer basis. And there there isn't it's hard when everything's coming from a volunteer standpoint to really engage people to participate in some of them, depending on, you know, which ones you're in or it's just been things kind of fall apart. Um, and that's what I've seen. Yeah, I agree. I think like initially there's a lot of excitement while joining the DAO and I think people see the potential, but you know, when push comes to shove and like months later, interest has dwindled, maybe dwindled a little bit. And, um, yeah, so it is interesting. I haven't like, have any of you guys been in part of any particular DAOs and like, what are your experiences take on? Yeah, I was part of Metagamma Delta, um, which is a DAO that funds women-led projects. I mean, I still am, but, um, and we've done, you know, it, the, that's been part of the problem is that the incentive to get people to put proposals together or like really be ahead of these committees that evaluate these projects. I mean, there's still people doing it and people that are really involved, but it's hard to, to get people to engage. Um, we also had some problems with the, uh, Polygon network, like voting, it got really slow and there was technical issues. Um, so that's been my, my uh, the issues I've seen is just really engagement and streamlining the processes uh, to something that can work for everyone. That's been my, my experience with it. Thanks, Erica, I appreciate that. Yeah, and like just one, sentence here on the regulatory side starting a DAO is easy you can create a multi-sig wallet requires multiple people to sign transactions together the cost of starting a compliant DAO however is immense so that's sort of like the takeaway yeah my friend is a my friend is a lawyer in the space and yeah it's you know it's to create a compliant one does take some work yeah and you know being compliant is a moving target as well in the space yeah Definitely. Amazon entering Web3 via NFTs. So this is interesting uh, because the Amazon company has been, or AWS, Amazon, um, has been in the Web3 realm to some degree. I know they've been hiring people in Web3 for at least a year now, um, but the what they're trying to do exactly wasn't clear. But here, I guess this is a rumor. Amazon is rumored to be unveiling a NFT initiative part of the retail giants larger push into web3 uh, the project could raise significant regulatory issues so um was that it for this prices no here it is so yeah yeah it talks about you know whether or not nfts are securities and how amazon is going to deal with that but let's try to see exactly what they're trying to build here so I guess the report was by Blockworks. Um, initiative coming soon. This is an exclusive published January 26th. Oh, advertisement. One example in the works per, per one source, getting Amazon customers to play crypto games and claim free NFTs in the process. So we might, might be seeing some games coming out of Amazon in that way. Um, it wasn't initially wasn't immediately clear who in terms of personnel is leading Amazon's NFT initiative details about the platform, which would include certain NFT gaming initiatives are still unfolding, but the two sources said the platform is set to run out of Amazon proper rather than its popular web hosting platform, AWS. Um, an additional fifth source said Amazon has been exploring a number of web three initiatives of late. All right. So, yeah, we'll definitely be seeing hopefully more news coming out of this from Amazon. I just think it'll be a really big moment for the industry because then you'll have, you know, more mass adoption, you can say. Um, over here, just to make a point, the CEO of Amazon has previously stated he's open to the company selling NFTs and that the company is not closing the door to cryptocurrencies generally. I think it's an important statement. Um, okay. 
Moving on. Oh, yes. So this is a government-related um, event that happened actually Tuesday, like yesterday, yes. Um, February, or sorry, January 31st. I guess there were multiple announcements or roundtables here. Uh, but my point is, it's interesting to see that the Copyright Office and the United States Patent and Trademark Office are working with people to understand non-fungible tokens and to study it and to determine how it will impact what they do. So there were three roundtables publicly available for everyone, one on trademarks, one on patents, one on copyright. I believe you can actually go ahead. If you can't view them already, you can, yeah, you can access. Um, I know it was recorded, so I think you can access those through their website somewhere. So check that out. It was a full day round table. It was like, I think eight hours or six hours or something. So there's a lot of information there. Um, yeah. Just wanted to point that out. If people weren't aware that the government is definitely trying to figure this all out here. And it's important that they do that because we need the right regulations to move forward. Uh, so a few weeks ago, I was in London where I got the chance to speak to many decentralized scientists and, um, it was an event called Decide London. I wrote a recap in conjunction with, uh, in collaboration with Vibe Bio, and you can read the recap here kind of dis discusses what was covered, who was there. A lot of it had to deal with, um, decentralized peer review in the scientific process, as well as patient DAOs. And um, yeah, just a new approach to funding, crowdfunding for uh, new drug development. Uh, that was something that Alok Tai talked about, the founder of iBio. Um, there were lots of other people, uh, Laura Minkini from Athena DAO was there and she spoke. And overall, it was a really good event, I thought, and progressive in terms of what's happening in the industry. So I thought there was some new announcements that were pretty cool. Um, yeah, even uh, Vitalik was on the screen as well, uh, interviewed by Vincent. It was a recording, but um, yeah, we got to participate in some workshops. So hopefully, if you guys are interested, you can check that out. There are many DSI events all over the world now. Um, so if you find one in your country or city, you should check it out. You'll learn a lot. All right. Moving on quickly here, because I know we have a lot to cover. So I noticed this article and it read to the Okay, Ray, you're breaking up a little bit. Oh, sorry. Can you hear me? Yeah, that's better. I right, appreciate that, Erica. So this article from Vice, I edited human DNA at home with a do-yourself CRISPR kit. Um, I thought this was interesting. We are, I think, all sort of familiar with biohacking as a as a trend. A lot of people are trying to you know, create their own nasal vaccines at home for COVID, for example, um, in their you know miniature labs. So. It's quite interesting because I do think that this sort of trend is going to continue to grow. That being said, I think it leads to potential safety risks and potential ethical risks as well, especially when it comes to CRISPR, where you can edit your own living um, genome or genetic DNA potentially. And, you know, there's a lot of potential downstream effects that we're not aware of yet. So we want to be doing this in a thoughtful way. Um, but the point is like, you know, this person kind of discusses how they went ahead and, you know, edited genes. Um, let me find a good put in perspective compared to the risks of driving cars, taking medicine, medication, using drugs, and any other risk we accept. I think they are minimal both to individuals and society, he said. So this is the person's perspective. Instead, the benefits are great. We've not had any real accidents from lay people using CRISPR. It's all hypothetical risks so far. P 
people might harm themselves with CRISPR, might create a pest dangerous to agriculture or to the environment or some other problem, but I consider it unlikely at present. So you can see like how comfortable this person is um, with doing this. His name is Zayner. And yeah, I just thought it was really telling of what's what's going on. Um, and it's not a crime. Biohacking is not a crime. Or I guess that's a sticker that they used. I'm sure that there are levels of criminality uh, in terms of what you can do. <laughs> you can't do everything, especially trials on humans um, without their consent and also registered with the FDA. So, you know, there are interesting risks here. There is a Netflix docu-series called Unnatural Selection. It came out in 2019 and um, it actually shows this person attempting to edit their DNA. So I just want to point this out. Um, it has implications for our future in biotech. So, yeah. Wait, Any how thoughts? easy is it? How easy? How easy is it to sell uh, to sell uh, CRISPR kits that is meant for human genome in the U.S.? Like I thought that would have been illegal. Yeah, that's a good question. So here, uh, he says he has claimed to make an at-home COVID vaccine in 2020, and then a, a fecal microbiome transplant. Uh, in terms of CRISPR, there's a company called Odin. And they sell kits. So let's go to Odin's website here, guys. Um, Do-it-yourself genetic engineering. And I think this is more like, a, you know, laboratory stuff. It's less about your personal genome, I think. Mm -hmm. But let's check this out. Do-it-yourself bacterial gene engineering CRISPR kit. $179. And you have even a pipette, everything you need. Um, let's see. Okay, so you do get the plasmid maps here. Yeah, you could just download the DNA files, um, template sequences. I haven't done this myself, so I'm not an expert in this. If you are, leave a comment and tell us if you can answer how easy it is to to get these kits for yourself and do it. Very curious. I'm just imagining how wild this uh, could get. Like if a person just uh, injected uh, the edited kidney cells into themselves and that causes, I don't know, health issues like maybe cancer. I don't know. I yeah, thought this would it. be more regulated for the human side. Like... I mean, I, I would understand if it's like with plants and like with animals and worms and rats or whatever, but. Yeah, in terms of like uh, living creatures um, or at least animals, humans. I don't know. It's a good question. Um, I'll, I, we can dig into that for next time, maybe, because I do think it's important and I think more people are doing it. So we need to kind of address some of these issues before it gets too late <laughs> but i don't I think that's so one, I, I don't think that will ever this? stop it either you know totally these tabs at the top living things what is that <laughs> living things yeah is so that you, right? okay got it yeah you can purchase you human cell lines <laughs> Jeez. No products in animal cell lines. And for human cell lines, you have human embryonic kidney cell lines. H-E-K-293. All right. Yeah. Thanks. I was just curious what they had available there. Sure. Thank you. All right. I'm going to move on to the next one. An article at Forbes. Vita at $4.1 million. And Balaji. So if these is that all you have Oh, you're breaking you're breaking up again, right? Sorry. Thanks. Okay. Um, let's see. So yeah, I think this is interesting to see the 
you know, traction that Peter Dow has, has made so far. Um, talks about Dow's. I don't think I want to get too much into it, but basically Pfizer Ventures has invested some money to get governance tokens um, and being an active contributor to the community. So you can read more about it here. All right, uh, legal dangers of getting involved with DAOs. So a lot of <laughs> DAO warnings here. Um, so buying DAO tokens, that's no longer risk-free. Courts might consider you as a partner in the business and judge you liable for millions in hacked funds. So what's, what it's saying is if you do join a DAO, um, you might be implicating yourself in the future because if, let's say, a company like, um, you know, Nike identifies that you join, there's a group of people who joined a DAO for sports DAO or something, and they're using the Nike logo, Nike sues sports DAO, everyone in the DAO might have liability there. So because it's, it's not just one person or owner, so it's, it's very tricky. Um, there is risk there. And just wanted to point that out for everyone interested. Do your research if you're joining a DAO. And if you're creating one, do more research. <laughs> and get a team, a legal team, perhaps. Um, one thing that you could do is you can create a, a foundation or a corporate wrapper. So you can, for example, have a S Corp or LLC or corporation representing your DAO so that you can benefit from the legal protections and liabilities of these corporate structures. Um, so here it says, in practice, however, courts may interpret DAO structures as general partnerships, which have unlimited, unlimited joint and several liability uh, for all participants, observes Jason Corbett, who's the managing partner um, at a law firm called Silk Legal. Uh, so yeah, I think this is an interesting article worth reading. I skimmed through it, but I think anyone interested in joining a DAO would benefit from definitely consuming this information. Um, any thoughts, questions, guys? All right. Moving on to the next article here. Yeah, another DAO topic. Uh, this one more on a positive note, DAOs might be cure for biotech startups and new drug development. This was published uh, about two weeks ago, and basically it's discussing how, it, actually it even, for example, says here, Vita DAO and Molecule are two DAOs that were created to fund longevity research. Again, Pfizer recently committed 500000 to Vita DAO, suggesting DAOs might be entering the mainstream. So you get people with shared interests. You collect um, money together for a specific purpose, and then money is used in order to conduct that research. And hopefully uh, those initial investors may have some benefits or rewards for doing so or not. Uh, it really depends. Um, the key here is that no DAO member has any financial interest in the target projects by reason of being a DAO member. Okay, so I guess this is an important note here. Um, but you still do get perks. Besides funding specific projects, DAOs could create additional benefits through the creation of tokens with unique rights or properties. As a condition to funding any particular project, a DAO might demand that its members be granted certain rights or benefits. This could include frontline access to clinical trials. I think that's a good one. Or discounted therapies. Um, of course, this would need to go through a compliance uh, approvals. So I'm not really sure how it would specifically be, um, you know, created or orchestrated in order to be compliant. But um, yeah, here it says there are also legal issues to navigate. Navigating or negotiating any tokenized rights can be complicated and whether tokens are securities 
and subject to Securities and Exchange Commission regulation is a hot topic. That's for sure. So, yeah, I thought it was interesting that Bloomberg Law has started talking about this in, in the terms of patient DAOs in, in, in the sense here. So that's really cool. I think there's more traction happening and it's good news. All right. Uh, so you guys have heard of a company from California a long time ago that promised that it can measure thousands of molecules from a single drop, but this one, and um, it's a different one. And researchers at Stanford Medicine have shown they can measure thousands of molecules from a single drop of blood. And I'm just gonna skim through here. Um, I guess my point is, um, we want to make sure that before this is commercialized, that the research is done and validated. And it'll be interesting to see, to see these test kits at home, potentially. So that's what they're saying here. The next step for the Snyder Lab will be to expand the pilot studies and offer multi-omic microsampling to a broader swath of patients. Several ongoing projects are evaluating if this method can be used for early disease detection. I mean, if this does work, I think it's really amazing, um, but we'll have to see if it really can pass tests and validation here. So just to be clear, in a pilot study of two, patient, two test subjects, the researchers were able to measure the levels of 128 proteins, 1,000, well, about 1,400 metabolites and about 700 lipids from each microsample. Amazing. Um, yeah. Moving on. So for TechCrunch, there's a company called Quick Node, which just raised a $60 million, $800 million valuation, claiming to be the AWS or Azure of blockchain. Uh, so this company... Um, here it says, when we raised a $35 million round, we were 20 people. Now we're over 120 people. The Nabatsvisky said, who is, um, I believe, the CEO, yep, yeah, CEO and co-founder here of the company. So that's a significant chunk of change. I think that's really incredible uh, how much they've raised. And... They were founded in 2017, and they're trying to build the Web3 infrastructure. Well, they're aiming to bring Web2 infrastructure to Web3, um, and it looks like they're gaining a lot of traction. Uh, the platform here handles over 200 billion API requests monthly and is always available with 99%, 99.99% uptime. Um, so interesting. Very curious how how this company will play out. They have, it says here, we have over 50,000 developers on the platform constantly requesting new things. Um, but for us, the roadmap is always the addition of protocols and working with these foundations. It's not just having a protocol, but a relationship to build with the foundations to be an extension of their ecosystems so that they and their developers can have a better experience. Yeah. Um, have you guys heard of Quick Node? Used it in any way at all? I have not. Thanks for sharing. It's interesting. I haven't either. Yeah, it is interesting. Um, you just hear it says here that its customer base includes major Web two companies like Twitter and Adobe, as well as Web three platforms like Coinbase, OpenSea, Chainlink, One Inch Network, Dune Analytics, and Phantom. So, pretty interesting. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, A16Z. Where's my tab here? Hmm. 
Okay. Uh, this is an article published this uh, last month. When is decentralizing on a blockchain valuable? Kind of discusses what your operating model should look like if you are trying to use a, a DAO for your organization. Um, figuring out how decentralized it should be and if it should be on a blockchain at all in the first place is is sort of like what this article kind of guides you through and discusses even like airdrops at what time should you decentralize so i thought it was quite useful for people here here it says it is optimal to choose decentralized governance if the size of the locked in effect is su sufficiently large so how large exactly sufficiently large is has to be determined on a case-by-case -case basis and depends on the specifics of the network, such as the strength of network effects, users' aversion to monetization, the potential profit from monetization and user growth. Um, and it suggests some academic work on how to measure that size of locked in effects that could be directionally useful. Yeah, uh, worth read, I think. They talk about, you know, game theory within this article. So, um, yeah. Next up here is from Science. And it's an announcement that the FDA no longer needs to require animal tests before human trials. Um, this doesn't mean that no drugs need animal trials. It just means that they some drugs can bypass that step and go directly to human trials in some cases after it's been approved. So it is a big deal because in many drug development processes, there has been times when drugs would go through animal testing, I guess sort of unnecessarily in a way. Um, and it, you know, it took longer for the drug to become approved overall. So by cutting down that time, patients might be able to get their drugs a little bit faster. So that's the, the purpose of doing this. Um, and they're using a lot of like um, in silica sort of testing instead of in, in animals. So here, last month, Lorna Ewart, chief scientific officer at Emulate, Ingber and colleagues published a study highlighting the potential of this technology, talking about silicon-based polymers. Uh, the company's liver chips correctly identified 87% of the variety of drugs that were moved into humans after animal studies, but then either failed in clinical trials because they were toxic to the liver or were approved for market, but then withdrawn or scaled back because of liver damage. The chips didn't falsely flag any non-toxic drugs. Interesting. Um, another method for doing these tests would be to use organoids, which are sort of like 3D clusters of cells mimicking the effects they would have in like a living uh, creature or human, or I'm sorry, uh, animal. Um, and human, actually. You can have human organoids as well. So, yeah. Yeah, I just read in there that they think it's unreasonable to test anti-nausea drugs in dogs. But like my understanding is the real reason that they use animals is just for safety. They're not testing efficacy. Um, and I, I think it's great that they're trying not to use uh, animals. So um, if they can come up with a better way, I think it's great. But yeah, I, I and especially if the drugs are, you know, similar to other drugs that are out there. Um, but yeah, I, I, I don't know what that statement's about. It's kind of weird because it's not, you're not testing the anti-nausea portion when you're testing toxicity, but whatever. <laughs> yeah, it says here that a, a judge ruled against the company though. They claimed that, but the judge ruled against the Oh, company. got it. Yeah, that makes sense. Citing the animal <laughs> testing requirement. Yeah, so. People have tried to bypass the animal test before. Um, so there's still going to be some like, you know, investigations into this, into these drugs before they just go into humans. But 
it won't require that specific requirement that has existed for many years. Yeah, I think that's good for the sake yeah. of the animals and everything else. Yeah. Yeah, we want these cute little guys to live. Yeah. <laughs> it's never it's 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 a ugly part of drug <laughs> development. <laughs> sure. Yeah. That's for sure. All right. Um there's a medium blog here posted that I thought was interesting by Aaron Zagal Daylov. And it sort of just maps out the ecosystem or the landscape for health data exchanges. Uh, it has Avenir, MediLedger, Hashtel, Softcare, PharmaLedger, uh, Equidium Health, Medical Chain, and um, I can't read that one, but it's all here. And uh, I, I thought this was interesting to see how this was mapped out. Um, yeah, I think there's probably more to include as well. But like, for example, um, well, we don't need to get into different examples here, but the point is like, this could be a really good starting point for people interested in what's going on in the health data exchange side of blockchain. And yeah, could lead to a lot of interesting discoveries. So I'll leave that here for you all. All right, the Entrepreneur Magazine. There was an article called Healthifying NFTs and discusses mainly actually uh, India's healthcare sector in this article, but it talks about how NFTs can be used to, uh, as a you know, data ownership of your health data, as well as maybe other things related to um, healthcare. So another benefit of health NFTs is that tokenized decentralized data can be accessed by the patient anywhere, anytime without making rounds of health facilities or yeah, which do not readily share detailed data. So yeah, it's good to see that, you know, entrepreneur India is, has been, you know, interested in this. This is an opinion expressed by Saptak Bardhan. So, so thank you, Subtok. Tech Times, and you've heard of this. Google Research and DeepMind launch an AI-based healthcare language model. Uh, it said it is said that it can provide safer answers for healthcare. Um, it's called MedPalm, and yeah, this is interesting because I think AI has been a hot topic in recent months, and I think medical related AI is going to be super interesting because it's going to be able to allow providers and patients to um, communicate in like a new way, I think. So uh, good stuff, I think. I mean, I haven't used it myself, but if someone has, very curious, uh, let us know. Um, yeah. All right. Um, these educational nuggets here, won't dive into too deeply, but First one is just Vitalik Buterin's post. He's the uh, founder of Ethereum uh, about stealth addresses, making potentially making it possible to send people NFTs or cryptocurrencies privately, uh, inherently through Ethereum. Uh, this is a theoretical system um, to be potentially proposed and put in place in the ethereum core code uh, so you can read more about it here to talk about shared secrets and how how the exchange would actually work you see here bob generates some kind of address um, and then bob sends this address his public address to alice either directly or by registering it on ens alice does some computation which generates another address and then uh, Alice sends a transaction which transfers the asset to that computated address, which is at the stealth address. Uh, and then Bob is able to control and spend the asset, but it's not publicly viewed. You know, they talk about stealth meta addresses, uh, the ephemeral pub key that's required as part of this. Sort of complicated, but also, you know, elegant in its own way. Um, I thought it was interesting to share. 
Next here is a correspondence article in Nature Magazine titled NFT for Management of Health Data. And let's see, it's here. It's quite a short article, actually. They just talk about the potential benefits of NFT tokenization um, in, in healthcare or in uh, yeah, healthcare data management, including data from patients, hospitals, insurance, government bodies, pharma companies, and research institutes. Again, this is, you know, interesting, uh, and I think reinforces the idea of using NFTs in healthcare. Um, I think we've done that a lot in this meeting and in previous meetings, so I think there's definitely progress in that space. Um, and then I posted two podcast episodes, um, one on DSI with Michael Fisher, and then one on machine learning during the, you know, patient doctor interaction uh, with the CEO of Nabla, which is a AI company in France. That's it for our agenda. Thank you all for joining. If anyone has any questions or anything to share, open to uh, discussion now. Well, Erica, you're the only one on so right now. <laughs> so thanks for hosting. That was yeah, no problem. Hopefully. Yeah, sure. after not being in the, in the space for so for for a minute, it was a great update. Thank you. Awesome. Yeah, if anyone listening on YouTube finds anything interesting here, want to share their thoughts, please do so, and subscribe and also like the video too. So thank you, and have a great week, everybody.